Hello and welcome to HDBB Online. It's our Good Friday service, and you may notice that things are a little bit different, and that's because it is. It is a service with creative elements, creative worship, and even creative readings. But beyond that, Good Friday is the day when we celebrate the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is when we remember that He died for us, for our sins, and for forgiveness. But before we go into a time of worship, why don't I pray for all of us? Lord, thank you for your death on the cross. Thank you that you love us so much. As we go into this moment of worship together, may our hearts be opened to magnify and glorify your mighty name. In this we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. Oh, oh, oh. 
Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge. 
to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that this was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to him, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified.
Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Today is a day of taunts. It's a day of pain. It's a day that shouldn't be easy to celebrate. And yet billions of Christians around the world through the ages have called this day Good Friday. In any normal circumstance, in a time of tragedy or loss, we would express our sadness and grief on a day like this. And yet this day, the most difficult, sorrowful, and unthinkable of all days, has been called good. Why? The philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once said, Irony is a disciplinarian feared only by those who do not know it, but cherished by those who do. By all accounts, the story of Jesus should not be a story worth celebrating, but a tragic, painful lesson about the life of a commoner who said and did a bunch of extraordinary things in first century Palestine and then was executed by his political oppressors. It should have been the shameful defeat of a short-lived movement that could have been. But history tells a different story. The events of Good Friday were not a tragic end, but the turning point for humanity. Still, on this day, we are confronted by a picture of utter irony. Instead of a throne, this king is lifted up on a cross to be crucified. Instead of adulation and cries of, long live the king, the bloodthirsty crowd cries out, crucify him. Instead of a crown of glory, a crown of thorns was twisted together and set on his head. Yet the irony reveals a deeper truth, a truth that is cherished by those who see it now, for Good Friday tells a different story from what it seemed at first. Today, I want to invite you to contemplate the truth of the cross through a different lens. For here on Good Friday, there is a beautiful truth to be found even within the ugly cruelty of the cross. When my four-year-old son Levi found out that his school cat, Mr. Noisy, had died, he cried at the shock and confusion of losing something dear to him. 
And my wife Jacinta and I, we, we processed with him the meaning of death and the hope that we have as Christians that death is not the final end. It looks final and yet the best comes after it. Later that evening, as Levi got ready to go to bed, he said to me, Daddy, can you pray that I will die so that I can go to heaven now and see Mr. Noisy? I said, good question, and your mother will answer that. The cross of Good Friday looked final, and yet the best came after that. It should have been a bad day, and yet something good was being fulfilled. The cross of Good Friday is a picture that even within the worst of times, there is a beauty and a hope that cannot be overcome. 700 years prior, the prophet Isaiah told of a, a coming king. He prophesied that this king would come as a servant and he will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Then in Isaiah 53, we read, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that, was, that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. The cross of Good Friday is something that both confronts us and comforts us. It comforts us because Jesus is with us in the pain and suffering of this life. It confronts us because Jesus went through that pain and suffering for us because of our sin. But how did this happen? In the beginning, when God created this world, He placed the first man and first woman in the Garden of Eden. Eden was this garden full of life and beauty. It was a place of no death and decay. It was a place that represented God's heart for humanity. But the first humans disobeyed God. And as a re result of that, evil and brokenness entered the world. Through sin, the curse of evil entered the world. Then in Genesis 3, we read of a visible sign of that curse the emergence of thorns and thistles. As the early humans were expelled from the garden, thorns and thistles would now mark their lives as a visible reminder of the cost of evil. And so it would be for us. I wonder if you are all too familiar with the thorns and thistles of life that can be brought by life. The thorns and thistles of life that may be the ir little irritations that plague us or the deeper pains that pierce us. They're found in that fail, failing marriage or in the child who is bullied, in that bleak medical diagnosis or the betrayal of a relationship, in the failure of a business, in the dark night of the soul. They're in the things that are both caused by us and that happen to us. We all have faced thorns and thistles of life. And maybe you are struggling with a pattern of behavior that Paul described in his life. For what I want to do, I do not do but what I hate, I do. Maybe through no fault of your life. Life has simply happened and there are no answers to the pain. Yet despite the taunts and thistles, there is a reason why we call today Good Friday. Jesus paid for the cost of evil by dying for us. At the cross, the thorns were put on him. Isaiah tells us that he took on himself that should have been meant for us. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. In Galatians 3 verse 13, we read of the curse of Genesis 3 being reversed. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. For in the same garden of Eden, where the thorns emerged, a promise was also told of the coming king who would one day undo the curse of the fall. One day, the curse of sin would be undone by the torn-pierced king who became a curse for us. You see, on the cross, Jesus, the second Adam, overthrew the reign of evil and commenced a new kingdom. It would take another king to overthrow a hidden kingdom. But this king was a different one. From the moment that Jesus was born, there were already rumors about his coming ascendancy as king. Herod, the king of the Jews, was so disturbed by the news of a new king of the Jews that he ordered the slaughter of all baby boys in Bethlehem who were less than two years old. At the start of Jesus' ministry, when he stood at the top of a mountain and proclaimed the arrival of a new kingdom, his words spoke of, of an upside-down kingdom, a kingdom that belonged not to the powerful and the dominant, but a kingdom of the meek, 
the poor in spirit, the downtrodden and the persecuted. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus proclaimed the year of the Lord's favour and good news to the poor. He proclaimed a freedom for the prisoners and the oppressed, but he had no political power. Jesus comes to us as a king, but he doesn't look like the kings that we are used to. His is a kingdom of ironies, where our conceptions of power are subverted. It doesn't look like what it really is, but perhaps that's because we don't yet know what to look for. A few days ago, Jacinta and I were at a party of one of Levi's friends. It was this brilliant party uh, for four-year-old boys. And as you can imagine, there were lots of other four-year-old boys, balloons, candy, and little toys. Now, it was getting late that day, and our neighbors, who also had a four-year-old boy, asked us for a favor. They needed to take their younger one home to go to bed, but they had a four-year-old boy who was really into the magic show by this point. And so they said, could you take care of Jethro? and bring him home with you when you're done. Now, our neighbors lived just around the corner from us, so of course we said yes. And then they left, and, and I realized that we hadn't told Jethro this new plan. And I thought, what if he didn't understand why his parents were not around anymore? So when the magic show was over, I, I walked over to Jethro, and I knelt on one knee to get to his eye level, and then I said these words to him, Jet, do you remember me? I'm Uncle Abel and I'm going to take you home. Your daddy and mommy told me to let you into my car, okay? And what I didn't know was that as I was saying these words, another lady was looking at us with the deepest concern. And she later on said to him, Jet, are you okay? And she scooped him away from me. It didn't look like what it really was. You see, Jesus had always been king, but not everyone recognized it. And here, at the height of the irony, Jesus is mocked and ridiculed for his claim to be king. In Matthew 27, verse 28, we read of this account. When the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and then they knelt in front of him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Yet what these soldiers didn't realize, as they were mocking him and setting a crowns of thorns on his head, was that they were taking part in the inauguration of their king. As Jesus hung on the cross to die for the sins of the world, a sign was put over his head saying, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. You see, the cross was a tool of cruel execution. It was said of the Roman Empire that they found it too brutal themselves that they eventually banned it. But it wasn't just a tool to kill. It was a tool to shame and to deface. You know, there are many deaths that are cruel and painful. And then there are some deaths that are worse than even the removal of life. The cross was designed for the removal of dignity. Naked and spat on, Jesus was bleeding from the beating and the whipping of the guards. And then he was nailed to the cross that he himself carried. Jesus was hard to recognize as the man that his loved ones knew, much less as the king of the Jews. Maybe today you are too going through a kind of emotional defeat, a loss of your sense of self. Maybe it's not a physical illness that you're facing, but a kind of defacing, a, a removal of your value and identity. In some ways, you could say that shame is a kind of death. At the cross, Jesus showed us the kind of king he is. He is the king who bore unbearable shame and indignity. And the very taunts that represent our sin was put on his head, a symbol of his subversion of sin. The very taunts that were used to mock his identity then revealed him for who he re really is, the king of all kings. I wonder, do you know this king? This kingdom that this king has is a donkey riding, feet washing, bread breaking, leper cleansing, Samaritan loving kingdom. He is a servant king. Two words in society normally as far opposed to each other as possibly can be. 
at the cross, Jesus defeated evil and sin forever. He reversed the curse of sin, but he did that in an unexpected way by dying a criminal's death and taking the sin of the world upon him. You may know this king or you may not know of this king, but my question to you today is, would you place your trust in this king? The story is told of a group of soldiers who were taken hostage in the Vietnam War. They were abused consistently. They were treated really poorly by their captors. And in fact, their captors would taunt them constantly by pretending to rescue them all the time. They would put on a show about being freedom fighters who had come to rescue them. And then they would mock them as they looked relief and then put them back in captivity again. And this would go on for many times until finally these soldiers would be so depressed and hopeless that would, they would just resign to the fact that they would never be rescued. One day, a group of Marines was sent to rescue them. And these Marines actually successfully broke through the enemy lines and they finally found the prison. Miraculously, they overcame the enemy and there they were there to save those prisoners. And there in the darkness of the prison, the Marines found the soldiers lying helplessly on the floor of their cells. But they encountered a problem. Though they were there to save them, the prisoners wouldn't trust any liberating force anymore. They had been so used to the lies, they had lost their ability to trust anymore. Then one Marine had a brilliant idea. In a stroke of genius, he dropped his weapons, he took off his helmet and his military uniform, and he went down to the floor to lie down with the soldiers. With great vulnerability, he stripped himself and got to the floor and told the prisoners, we are here to help you and to set you free. And in that moment of great courage, they believed him and they began to get up and leave the prison. You see, Jesus is the great and sovereign king who came to save you. But he's also the king that you can trust. He came to establish a new kingdom built on love and service. He came to overcome death itself by facing death face to face. He reversed the curse of sin so that you may know a life of fullness. And he did it in an ultimate act of love by giving his life for you. So this Good Friday, look at the cross that should have been the end of a movement, but that really became the turning point of history. Look at the crown of thorns that should have devalued his worth but that really became the fulfillment of the promise of his kingdom. Look at the hope that lies behind the worst of all nights. For on this Friday, what was meant for evil was turned for good. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for what you have done for us on the cross. We thank you Lord, that on a night that was so tragic and cruel, so ugly, and so brutal that hope and beauty could not be hidden. And we thank you that today we can trust in you as our great King. So we look to you. We look at the cross today with gratitude, with the hope that only comes from you. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Thank you so much for praying and worshipping with us. If you do need prayer, please feel free to scan the QR code on the screen and someone will reach out to you sometime this week to pray for you. But the story does not end there. This Sunday we celebrate Easter, which is the day that Jesus resurrected from the grave, defeating death and having victory for all of us. We have our usual services at 9.30 a.m., 11.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. For now, God bless and see you this Sunday.